The Agenda with Steve Pakin is made possible through generous philanthropic contributions from viewers like you. Thank you for supporting TVO's journalism. Tonight on The Agenda. It's just much easier to say, oh, you just need a well tax and let's just get more out of, you know, somebody, some obscure, abstract pool of people that most definitely does not include me. I don't want to pay <laughs> more tax. Then, later tonight. In a sense, we sort of glutted the marketplace with, with animals, um, you know, who were, were being purchased and sold instead of being adopted. And some of those animals are now the ones who are being given up to shelters. <laughs> This year's federal budget promised that Canada is, quote, raising taxes on the wealthiest 1% to cut taxes for the middle class. It also introduced some luxury taxes and pointed to action on so-called shell companies that better off people can use to shelter money. Are such moves enough to collect more and make a fairer tax system? Or is it, as some argue, time for a wealth tax in this country? Let's ask, in the nation's capital, Tyler Meredith. He is co-founder of Meredith Bosenkuhl Policy Advisors and a senior fellow at the Maytree Foundation. And here in our studio, Allison Christians, professor of tax law at McGill University and the author of Tax Cooperation in an Unjust World. Barute Luxanate is here. She's a lawyer and principal at Portfolio Estate Law. And Graham Moffat, senior fellow at the Monk School of Global Affairs and Public Policy at the University of Toronto, and it's great to have you three here with us. You two, again, you in person for the first time? Yeah, that's right. You for the first time ever on the program that's at right. all. Beautiful. And Tyler, good to have you on the show again from the nation's capital. Paul Kershaw from Generation Squeeze, and he's going to get us off to a start here thinking about the question of what constitutes wealth. We've done some polling recently where we were trying to probe Canadians' understanding of who's economically at risk, who's affluent. And we started with a scenario of, imagine a widow with an income of just 25000 has her barely over the guaranteed income supplement living, so really close to low income. Rich or poor? Oh, that, that sounds poor. She lives in a home that she owns, right, owns outright and it's worth a million bucks. People were not so sure now. Imagine the home's $2 million, which is not uncommon in the Toronto area or Hamilton no. area. And like, oh, no, that person's rich. Then we swap it around and say, imagine a young lawyer making $200,000. It puts him in the top few percent of income earners in this country. Oh, definitely affluent. They're renting. And suddenly like, suddenly, like, oh, no, that person is less affluent than the widow with 25 grand who owns outright a home worth $2 million. I think we need to be recognizing that... An older demographic might not view itself as Jeff Bezos or Elon Musk, mm. but the relative affluence and security that comes with secure housing is something that a younger demographic is feeling really crowded out of and they're being jeopardized by it. Paul will have more to say about this later in the program when he's coming up as a guest uh, after this discussion. But he raises an interesting question of what constitutes wealth in this country and therefore how do we design a tax system accordingly. All right. You've heard what he had to say. Yeah. How do you react? Ah, well, I think we always start with the fundamentals, right? You know, the tax system has to be fair uh, in order for people to accept it and to cooperate with it. And so anytime there's a sense that things are not, not fair or they're getting less fair, I think people start saying, well, we need to fix, uh, we need to fix it. And often people want to start by fixing it with something new, like a wealth tax, <laughs> instead of fixing the system that we have. So, you know, I've said this before on the program, I think we often have to go back to the fundamentals and look at our income tax system the way that it works now and start thinking about what we could improve with the system we have before we start layering on top. Tyler, what does that comment say to you about what constitutes wealth in this country? Well, look, I, I think it is realistic for people to know that, um, you know, wealth has actually improved quite a bit over the course of the last 15 years. People have actually gotten richer um, and and that's true at all in all groups for the most part except the, the very poorest in our society um, but the old adage you're richer than you think is actually true <laughs> um, and in fact wealth inequality has actually improved even post pandemic uh, 
um, in the last three or four years, something that I think would be shocking to a lot of people. But I think this goes to a basic question of do people feel like the economy is working for them? And a great example of that, so like Graham, I also teach at the University of Toronto. And uh, students in my class, we were recently talking about tax issues, and they, ex when they talked about tax, they said to themselves, I don't feel like I'm going to get ahead, and I also don't feel like I'm going to get ahead because I don't know that I'm going to be able to buy a house. And so I don't know that that translates into we have to therefore change the tax system to address that problem, but we have to be able to show people that they are able to get ahead in society. Okay. Barute, how do you react to what you just heard from Paul and the rest? Well, I will tell you that I work with older clients who uh, do estate planning work, and they are very dismayed at the already high level of taxation. And they feel that the wealth that they have accumulated throughout their lives is due to the very frugal lifestyle that they pursued that is not really comparable to the lifestyle of the current younger generations that may not be able to afford to, uh, to buy a home, for example. And also have observed that when younger people inherit an estate, they are not necessarily very enthusiastic about saving that house of the family or buying a house with inherited assets. Rather, they would like to invest that money in something that brings enjoyment on a daily basis or perhaps luxury purchases. So the frugality of the previous generation may not be echoed in this generation. That is my observation. That is, okay. Graham, how do you react? So, um, you know, to, to go a little further on Paul's point, um, uh, there, there's a question of intergenerational fairness here mm -hmm. uh, about uh, an incredible amount of wealth generated by especially the housing market in Canada um, and people really struggling to feel like they're, they're able to build that kind of nest egg um, in a younger generation. Now, I'm, I'm sure many of Barute's clients uh, are you know, slightly older than the baby boomer generation, but I don't think we would call the baby boomer, boomer generation particularly frugal in historical terms. Um, we, we do have a problem of how we're going to pay for all of the social services that we have come to take for granted and that we you know, appreciate as a society. Um, and how we're going to pay for those is really the, the major question in intergenerational fairness with taxation. Whether we're going to tax the incomes of workers in the future and increase those taxes, or whether we can find a way to have the oldest and wealthiest members of our society pay more share, a greater share of the, the services they're consuming, which tend to increase as they age because the cost of health care as you age increases. For sure. Allison, do you think, given, given, I think one of the things that emerges from Paul's comment is it, it is a little trickier to figure out who's wealthy in this country and who isn't. Having said that, do we need a wealth tax in this country in order to pay for all the things that everybody says they want? Right. So, okay, everybody thinks everybody else is wealthy and they are themselves not wealthy. Right. And everybody always thinks I'm paying a very high amount of tax and I don't want to pay more tax. So we have to start from that proposition that um, I think people don't actually know where they stand. And I think it's, it's correct to say um, it's hard to determine whether this person is more wealthy than that person unless you take as the principle of the tax system that we should be taxing on the basis of ability to pay. And that's embedded in the income tax. Yeah, we do that so, already. Yeah, we do that. And so we think about wealth tax. When you say wealth tax, I say, okay, I'm not opposed to a wealth tax, but what do you mean? Like, what are we going to tax? So w when you say wealth tax, do you mean, would you like to tax the value of everyone's home every year? Well, the property taxes already do that, right? So are you adding on top of that? And is that means tested? Is there an ability to pay component to that? I think that you have to start asking those hard questions. And, you know, it's just much easier to say, oh, you just need a wealth tax and let's just get more out of, you know, somebody, some obscure, abstract pool of people that most definitely does not include me. I don't want to pay. <laughs> more tax. So the right? dev devil is definitely in the details and the details are, are tricky here. They're always tricky and they're yeah. always based on that fundamental question of what when you start talking about what is fair you have to at interrogate that question. You hmm. can't just assume we know what is fair. What's your reaction to a wealth tax? Well, um, I recently read a study that looked at the history of the wealth tax in Europe. So currently there are still four countries in Europe that levy uh, the wealth tax. Three of them on the uh, global assets of a resident, um, which are um, in Norway, Spain, and uh, Switzerland. And in Norway and Switzerland, these taxes have been levied since the 19th century. Hmm. Now, in 1996, there were actually 12 countries that levied this tax. 
and they repealed this tax because it did not deliver the economic results and the tax uh, objectives of the countries. It didn't bring in the money they expected. So it brings in a very small fraction of the uh, budget of those countries, and um, it actually encourages to immigration, capital flight, um, very difficult uh, assessment processes, because if you levied this tax in its purest form, you would have to value the value of the assets. They would have to be levied on the global estate of a person. So it, where assets are located in other countries, you would have to tax those assets as well. But how do you properly assess the value? So do you require an annual valuation? Too complicated. Then. It's very complicated. It may be a good idea, but it definitely needs a further assessment. Tyler, how about you? You, you for a wealth tax? No, um, at least not in the form that it, that is described often by, uh, say, Senator Warren, and and not because it's not pointing at a, an important problem, which is that wealth has gone up significantly, particularly in the top uh, income uh, and, uh, and and wealth categories over time, notwithstanding what happened in, in the pandemic. Um, but just because it's, it, I just think it's a huge waste of time. Um, it's going to take five years to build the administrative capacities to be able to measure and tax those things. Um, and it's very easy to move money around. I mean, a lot of liquid asset is is just cash, or it's even illiquid assets, which is very hard to to measure. And so, why would we spend all of this time and effort to try to go after a very particular form of of inequality in our society when there are other other simpler backdoor ways to go at the same issue, which could be either changing how we look at income or even just better enforcing the rules that we have. We actually lose a fair bit of, of tax just by simply having so many loopholes in our tax system. We'll look through the back door uh, a little later in our discussion here. But Graham, I mean, that is, that is part of the problem here, right? The, a, a wealth tax sounds like a neat idea, a neat populist, easy to get money yes. idea. But the devil in the details is so tricky and, and it yeah, take a long there's, time a, to there's out. a big, big, huge chasm between rhetoric and reality, mm -hmm. and the, po the political rhetoric and the reality of imposing a wealth tax. Um, it, I think we're all in agreement that a wealth tax is is impractical, at least on this panel. Um, everyone who's looked at it, you know, most tax policy experts who've looked at this will say, okay, well, most countries are abandoning their wealth taxes. We're, we have fewer countries with wealth taxes now than we did 10 years ago and 10 years before that. Um, the, the, the practical realities of implementing a wealth tax, measuring everyone's assets and forcing, you know, basically telling the, asking everyone what they own all of the time and to have the government have that information is not something everyone's comfortable with. Mm. Um, there are ways of doing this, though, uh, that are much more practical and uh, don't impose the kinds of undue burdens on people who may have, you know, relatively high wealth, like a $2 million home and a relatively modest income. And that is that when someone's estate is transferred, when they die, and their estate passes to a relative or to, you know, someone else, um, they do have to assess and measure all of those assets. Mm -hmm. So we do give a value to the estate. Um, and at that point, it can be taxed. Those are inheritance taxes. Uh, Canada stands out in the OECD as uh, for not having an inheritance tax. Most countries have an inheritance tax. Uh, in most countries in the OECD, it brings in about half a percent of total taxes. Um, and in places like Japan and Korea, it brings in about one and a half percent of overall taxes. Do you like that as an idea? It's certainly a better idea than a wealth tax. Um, I think it's probably less painful to pay a tax when you're dead than when you're alive. <laughs> okay. <laughs> yes. Tyler, what do you think of the inheritance tax idea? Well, we do actually have elements of an inheritance tax already, right? Because we have this rule called deemed disposition in the tax system. What deemed disposition in the tax system means is that when you die, if you have assets that are held uh, in, let's say, stocks and bonds or ETFs, they will automatically be deemed as being sold the estate. And so um, capital gains, if, if it's not in a tax sheltered account, will have to be paid at that point in time. Um, and income will have to be paid as though it has been um, pro proceeds to the estate. So um, we, we already kind of have some version of an estate tax. It's just making sure that you pay tax at the time that the income comes out. The issue that we, what we don't capture is there are some elements of things that, that just transfer, right, that aren't um, that aren't included in, in what we would consider to be taxable. And there, I think there's a question of should they be in or should they be out. Um, there are ways you could actually, if you wanted to expand it, an, an estate tax, I mean, you could you could basically use the existing system of probate fees as a way to potentially broaden that out into, into a version of an estate tax that wouldn't have the the uh, the burden of uh, complexity of introducing a whole new system as we as we would if we had to introduce a wealth tax. Hmm. 
What about you, Allison? In mm. Inheritance or estate taxes? Better well, we, way to go? Yeah. So we have, uh, when you die, uh, it's like you sold everything uh, for tax purposes. So I, I don't agree that we don't have an inheritance tax. We do, we have an estate tax in that sense. Um, I think the the key is that the you can do intervivos, you can do transfers during your lifetime, you can do planning during your lifetime to minimize your taxes. Uh, and I think most Canadians probably don't understand exactly the extent to which people who have means are able to plan their way out of paying taxes. Mm -hmm. And again, I think that feeds into this narrative, right? That, uh, well, we need more taxes from the wealthy. Well, are we getting taxes from the wealthy? Like, how are we getting taxes from the wealthy? And if there's a chasm, the chasm is that, well, we have actually ex uh, made a lot of exceptions in the income tax for capital, right? So your TFSA, your RSP, your pension, all of these things are not going to be taxing uh, capital. And so as the income tax focuses less on capital, it focuses more on employment uh, and other kinds of income. And I think people who are on a fixed budget, but they have capital, and we think capital is not being taxed, then it's just creating that sense that there's just an unfairness and how, why can't we fix that? There's lots of reasons that we might, wanna, might not be able to fix that. That's politics rather than the policy. Okay, before you get there, yeah. let's, let's do a real estate follow-up here. What a 1% tax on capital gains on point of sale of principal residences be a fair way to get more money out of the public? Yeah, so actually, this is a great uh, area where we do need to have a fix. Okay, so right now, uh, if you sell your principal residence, your home, uh, no matter how much you make, uh, you're not going to have any tax. And this is unusual. In the U.S., uh, there's an exemption up to 250000 of gain per person. You know, uh, why are we not thinking about ability to pay in that scenario? So, of course, for most people, there should be, uh, there's a sense that we should protect the family home. We should protect the home is mostly where you live. It's not your investment. Not, but it is for many people their primary investment. So we sh maybe a 1% tax, I'm not sure. That's not really how I would do it personally. I would say, you have an exempt amount, um, and above the exempt amount, that is capital gain that should be included in income. That would be in line with the uh, United States and other countries. Uh, and I think then you would start at least to um, to build into the income tax system, re, uh, reinserting cap some excessive amounts of capital, mm -hmm. and then maybe smoothing that out. But always, I always start from this place that it has to depend on ability to pay. You can't just throw taxes at everybody and say, we're just going to throw a percentage everyone and that's going to be fair. It's not necessarily going to be fair. There, People have different abilities to pay and we do have different uh, policy objectives always. How do you like that idea? I don't like the idea. <laughs> I think that uh, selling one's home already leads to a large outlay. So for example, you have to pay your real estate agent up to 5%. Then if you use that money to buy a new home, you pay land transfer tax. And then if you have 1% less of your original home proceeds, then you're maybe you're not able to afford a new home. I don't like this idea. Okay, having said, I'm, I'm gonna let you get back at that because you, you, you probably deserve it. Well, she doesn't like your idea. She does, she, it's not my <laughs> idea she doesn't like. I, I think, uh, can we bring this up? I mean, one of the reasons that, that uh, governments are, are, I guess, considering trying to do taxes related to real estate is look what's happened to wealth in this country you know, over the last 50 years or so, 45 years, when, and for those listening on podcast, we've got a graph up here, net wealth in housing in Canada, your principal residence in 1977, didn't matter if you were under 45 or over 55, you know, the amount of wealth you had in your home was basically about the same. If you go to present day, 58% of those over 55 have got, like, lots of real estate mm -hmm. money, right? Whereas those uh, under 45, it's only 21%. So that's an issue. So what do we do about that? Well, I go back to my original comment that um, I think it's the lifestyles of the younger generations that... <laughs> They're going to love that comment. They're going to love that. Them to, 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 and of course, real estate. But, but why is real estate so expensive? That's another question. Why do we have $3 million homes and then what's the other option? 
you know, a, a $1 million condo. Why isn't there anything in between to allow people to be able to afford something That's a different more show. affordable? That's a different so show. I, I well, think this, is, is, not it a, Steve? this yeah. is not a straightforward okay. answer. Okay, Graham, it isn't, it isn't. What do you mean? So part of the reason why we have um, homes that are 2 and $3 million mm -hmm. is because that's a tax-exempt investment. Right. Mm -hmm. Right? So if you set the tax code up such that there are certain categories of, of capital investments that are tax-exempt and, and others that are not, the money's going to flow toward the ones that are tax-exempt. Uh, especially on disposition. Mm -hmm. And that, in that case in Canada, that's principally homes, principal residences. So what we're seeing is uh, people willing to overinvest and overspend on homes because they know that they're going to get the money out without any tax. They know that home prices are going to go up over the long term, they always have, and they're going to get a profit without any, paying any tax on it. So those conditions distort they the situation they, so, they, so they do distort the prices of homes, mm -hmm. of course. If we, if we change the tax system, um, as you might have su you've suggested, hmm. whether it's through an estate tax or a property tax on um, the sale of principal residences, you're going to see a shift in the amount of money pouring into the residential real estate sector. Got it. Tyler, where are you on all this? Well, look, so I go back to what did my students at the University of Toronto tell me, right? They, they want more affordable housing. And I don't see how putting a, a tax on principal residences is going to make more affordable housing. The reason that we uh, don't have affordable housing is because we're not building enough of it. We need to build more of it. And so if you if you had a plan that said, we're actually going to be able to build the 1.5 million homes that Doug Ford says we need to build, which we're not on anywhere close to being on track to building. But if we actually had a plan of how to build 1.5 million homes and that that required some amount of public subsidization to do it, then I would say, well, what are you, wh how are we going to finance that? Are we going to finance that by by looking at other creative ways to tax, uh, let's say, investment properties, for example. That might be something that we should be interested to look at. But if we're talking about principal residence exemption, I mean, the, the problem in our real estate sector, I would argue, has not been created by people getting shelter, by people wanting to have their own home. It's been because we're not building enough homes and because they're competing with investors in the market. So we've got to solve those problems. And tax can be part of that solution, but I don't think you're going to you're going to solve the problem on the, on the principal home by making the principal home more expensive. Now, Allison, you heard Barute uh, react yeah. uh, rather vigorously yeah. to the suggestion that you put forward. You, yeah. want, you want to take a second yeah, take but I, I don't think she's taking issue with what I'm suggesting. I think she's taking issue with the idea of a flat 1% tax mm. because what she described is, well, what about these fees and what about this and that? Mm. In an income tax, you would deduct those fees uh, so that your gain is just on the excess. And also, I'm proposing a uh, uh, a floor before you impose the tax. Yes. So this is means tested in the sense that if you aren't having that much gain, you're not facing the tax. So I think what uh, the objection here is a flat tax on the gross price, and that is going to distort uh, or cause some problems at the bottom of the scale when you don't have a lot to work with and you take 1%. I mean, it doesn't sound like a lot, but to somebody who has very little, that is it's going to make uh, impact the, the, re, the repurchase. Okay, but in terms of the price of homes, like if you say we don't have enough housing, let's build more housing, and you're going to subsidize it. Wait a minute. So you're going to have the tax proceed, the have the proceeds from your sales be tax free, and you want the government to also buy uh, the to pay for new houses, like double subsidy. Don't do this, right? Don't do this. So the key here is if the market's too hot and and if the proceeds are always tax free, then yeah, sure, in the long time if we have the tax on the proceeds from the sale of your principal residence maybe you know we're going to flatten or you know, cool off the market but there's a lot of speculation in the housing market too and a lot of it is foreign as well so we have to be thinking about how are we taxing uh, holistically and not just think well a one percent tax is going to raise x dollars because we know people are going to plan around it <laughs> so I, I think I think you agree with me that there should be an exempt of uh, uh, some part that's exempt maybe above that you might be willing to consider a tax, and what you're taking issue with is a flat tax. Well, we have the vacant homes tax uh, in Toronto mm -hmm. and in some other cities where someone has a second home that is not used, they have to pay a tax to Toronto. And for non residents, we have the underutilized um, right. housing tax now. So, right. yes, exactly. So, we're working towards that. Yeah. Okay, moving along, kids. Here we go. Uh, Sheldon, can I get this graphic up top of page two? Alan Lanthier from the Financial Post, who recently wrote, 
Not that recently, actually, but who wrote a few years ago. A recent report in Canadian Business estimated that Canada's 25 wealthiest families have a net worth of close to $200 billion, an average of $8 billion per family. Meanwhile, 15% of lower-income Canadian families have a net worth of less than $500. So, to help address this gap, should we be asking Canada's wealthiest to pay more taxes? In addition to numerous annual taxes and levies, they already face capital gains tax on death. But what if taxation on death can be avoided? Okay, Brute, start us off on that. Can taxation on death be avoided? So, Canada has a unique rule that where a taxpayer dies, there is a deemed disposition of all their wealth well, capital assets primarily, um, which was mentioned already. Uh, and this includes not only their Canadian assets, but also their assets abroad. And Canada is a country of immigrants, and I have so many clients who have real estate in other countries, and they don't realize that if they pass away, even that foreign real estate will be subject to the Canadian uh, capital gains tax. Now, there are, there are exemptions, um, if they can be called exemptions. Uh, that's a rollover to a spouse or a spousal trust. So that's the only time when uh, a deemed disposition on death uh, does not result in tax. Um, in all other cases, yes, uh, tax applies to that wealth. Um, now, can it be avoided? Well, if you structure your assets during your life in a way that you don't own that wealth at the date of death, then your hmm. tax is minimized. And that's legal tax avoidance? Well, it is a tax planning, certainly. Tax planning, um, okay. And at best, it's tax deferral. There is no such thing as complete tax avoidance. Okay, Tyler, in terms of uh, the appropriateness of tax planning and tax avoidance, how does this sound to you? So this this is an area that actually requires a lot more study and analysis because it, it is there's a huge there are huge issues here and and it's very and you know Alan and I it's funny Alan and I have disagreed on many things but he points at a really important issue in that piece um, and and that is that you we we allow very creative tax structures and very creative tax planning to be able to avoid um, taxes and and on a certain level that is legal and appropriate but. But it's whether or not you are entering into sophisticated planning that the average person, in absence of having access to those professional resources, would be able to do themselves. And, and this is actually where there's been a lot of effort, both by the federal government in the last couple of years, but also by a lot of governments around the world, to try to create stronger rules to anticipate these structures and to basically say that they're offside from the beginning. Now, whether that would capture this kind of situation that Alan has laid out, not sure. But, but the point being, this is we could actually generate a, a, far, a, a far greater share of public revenue just by simply uh, in, uh, better implementing the spirit of, of the Income Tax Act on its own. Hmm. Graham, let me follow up with you in this regard. We're not talking about tax evasion here, which is illegal. We're talking about legal tax avoidance, trying to legally pay as little as possible. This is a great cottage industry in Canada. Should we be discouraging this in order to have more money come into the Treasury to pay for the things, the services that Canadians want? Well, it, yeah, it, it gets at an important point, which is that, um, you know, we can impose uh, very complex new tax structures and we can bring into being new tax laws. We can try to do things like wealth taxes. Uh, but probably the easier way to bring in more revenue to pay for the services we want is to enforce the laws that we have on the books better. Um, so, for example, CRA, uh, invested fairly heavily in the last few years in enforcement. Uh, and that appears to have paid, at least uh, you know, anecdotally, appears to have paid huge dividends in terms of the amount of tax being brought in. It always does. Yeah. Every, every Minister of Finance I've ever interviewed, if they send a few more auditors out there, they always get more money coming in. Yeah, so that's, 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 probably, that's probably step one. And then step two would be closing loopholes, like some of the ones that are used, some of the more egregious ones used in tax planning. Um, so rather than creating new kinds of structures like wealth taxes or complex new inheritance taxes, just doing things like closing loopholes, like for example, I think, what it, what's it called, estate freezes, um, which Barute could probably speak to, um, <clears throat> ways of transferring wealth between generations uh, without having it seen by and taxed by the state in the way that ordinary people do. You know, these are things, the kinds of things that you do if you're worth hundreds of millions or billions of dollars mm -hmm. that really is not accessible to uh, ordinary people. And we have to ask whether that's fair and whether we should close those loopholes. Is that fair? And should we close those <laughs> loopholes? He said well, I had to ask. Um, <laughs> right. Uh, well, let's look at it. So what is an estate freeze? So an estate freeze uh, is a structure that allows to transfer the future growth on your um, wealth. 
uh, to be earned by other individuals, so your, your family members, for example, or perhaps your employees. If you're an incorporated business, you can give um, shares of, uh, that will hold the future growth in your company to your employees. Um, now, who uses estate freezes? So estate freezes are often utilized by small businesses. Um, who want to allow their families to retain that, that small business in the family. Now, if you prevented uh, estate freezes from being available, those families may not be able to continue the business within the family after the um, original founder of the business passes away. Um, only 40% of all small businesses in Canada actually are continued by the next generation. That's a small, that's a fairly small percentage, I would say. Well, relatively small percentage. And then that percentage decreases to when we look at further generations. Now, if that family had to find the cash to pay tax on the death of their father, for example, if, on when that uh, value became taxable on death, that problem of continuing the business would be so much greater because not only would they have to want to continue the business, but they would also have to find the money to be able to continue the business. So I think that um, estate freezes are actually still a very uh, good uh, option. Uh, you don't mind if, very... I, you mind if I seek a second opinion on this? <laughs> Absolutely. <laughs> Allison, what's your view? Well, look, I don't think that it's possible to think about tax without thinking about uh, when the law says that this is taxable, then the taxpayer is going to say, well, I'm not going to do that. I'm going to do something else so mm -hmm. I don't face the tax. So this is an inherent problem with building a tax system. You're going to write a rule, and then most people are going to follow the rule. And they will follow the rule if they think the rule is going to be enforced against them. And if they, generally speaking, people sort of voluntarily cooperate with the tax system. Now, the more sophisticated your plan gets, the more uh, possible some people are going to not have to follow the, the rule. They'll go around that rule. That's not something you can stop. The taxpayer is going to try not to pay the tax. Um, so the question is, is this egregious? So I, in the, on the scale of egregious from a state freeze to, you know, sort of Loblaws as a bank, I think, you know, there's, uh, there's a, a big a gulf here. And I think there's an obscurity gulf as well. And that's the one that worries me. What does that mean? Well, so your standard, your average taxpayer does not understand what an estate freeze is. So it sounds bad and it sounds scary and it sounds like, oh, that sounds like tax avoidance. We really should shut that down. But then if you start digging into the details and looking at it, they might say, oh, okay, well, maybe there are reasons that uh, we haven't shut that down. This is not a new strategy. This is not something they came up with last year. But how many taxpayers are, uh, watching the Supreme Court when the Supreme Court has to decide whether some convoluted scheme that some giant company has cooked up for years, you know, with a bunch of lawyers, how many taxpayers are watching that and saying, oh, wait a minute, I don't like that that is the outcome here. I don't like that there are all these other things that I don't understand in the tax system. And so this obscurity gap, you know, makes my, my job really hard, right? Because I don't want to defend an estate freeze. I don't care about the estate freeze. But I do think that there are uh, very structural problems in the Income Tax Act. Uh, and some of those, if I started telling you about them, you would just yawn. You would say, I don't care about interest deductibility. And I would never you know, yawn when you talk. You, well, <laughs> you know. after a while, you but, might. But I did, uh, one of the things that emerges from this conversation is that is that it doesn't sound like whatever new thing you want to do is going to be problem free. Every right. pro you know, everything you want to do is going to create some other problem. So Tyler. What should we do? Well, actually, uh, just to pick up on Allison's point, because I think there's a really important thing there. Um, one of the most important things that I think has happened in the tax system in the last number of years, it just happened in this budget, in the last federal budget, it's it called the modernization of the general anti-avoidance rule. And this is super important because it gets at the issue that Allison just raised, which is it it used to be you had to basically, if CRA found something that, that, that was inappropriate, that was excessive tax avoidance and aggressive tax planning, it had to go to the court and basically prove that that was that that was the intent that there was there was an obvious attempt to try to flout the spirit of the tax act the income tax act now under the the proposed modernized general anti avoidance rule we would say 
you have to prove that there is a valid economic substance to this transaction that you want to do, and that that the tax value of that doesn't outweigh all the other attributes that you're that you're proposing to get. And that's important because it it actually makes it, it puts the the burden of proof of the fairness of the tax system in the on on the uh, on those who are actually trying to use it for tax planning purposes. That is one of the most important things that we could do. Graham, what would you do? I think that I'm. So Tyler's raises an important point. That's a that's a fundamental change to the tax system, mm -hmm. and I think it's a major contribution. Um, you know, if we if we look at what um, this government has managed to do over the last eight or nine years, um, I guess it's eight years that they've been in power. Um, there have been some minor changes to to the way that they structure taxes, uh, but by and large, they've left the tax system uh, alone. They haven't they haven't done any major structural reforms to it. Um, and I think that's probably the best we can hope for uh, with the, federal, the kinds of federal governments that we get these days, uh, which are you know, often minority governments. They don't have a lot of political capital to spend on major reforms to the tax system. So uh, incremental steps, closing loopholes, uh, you know, these, these, kinds of, these kinds of fixes are, we already have a very progressive income tax system. And the question is, what are we going to do to pay for these, you know, the expansion of services and the reduction in the, the ratio of workers to retirees in the future? Um, and it's going to be incremental steps, I think, is, is the best we can hope for. Mr. Director, can I get a shot of everybody here? So I can thank everyone for coming into TVO tonight, and Tyler, and you in the nation's capital as well, and joining our little uh, love fest about tax law here on the agenda tonight. Thanks, everybody. Thank you. Thanks. In the depths of pandemic lockdowns and social distancing, many people, desperate for something good, sought out and adopted pets of all kinds. Now, those puppies and kittens are all grown up, and sadly, some are reportedly winding up far from being treasured family members. With us now for more, in Maple Ridge, British Columbia, Kathy Powelson, Executive Director of Paws for Hope Animal Foundation. And here in our studio, Phil Nichols, he's the Chief Operating Officer of the Toronto Humane Society, and Camille Labchuk, Executive Director of Animal Justice, and we are happy to have you two here in our studio. Phil, I don't think you've been here before. First time for you? First time. Great. Camille, good to see you again. And Kathy, thanks for joining us from the left coast. Uh, Phil, let's start with this. Um, Rouge National Park in mm -hmm. Toronto, very well-known place. It has apparently seen a threefold increase in abandoned animals in the park. We talk dogs, we're talking cats, we're talking rabbits, we're talking even, apparently, reptiles. Why is this happening? Yeah, I mean, it's, it's happening from what we've seen because of access to care, and shelters are running at capacity, right? Um, animal shelters across the country are experiencing high demand of animals being surrendered and brought in. A lot of them are having to turn people away. When they're being turned away, they're left without places to choose, and some of them are sadly just being abandoned outside in parks. Um, and it's the ones we find are in parks. The question is how many are being abandoned outside of, you know, well-trafficked areas by people that are um, not being found. Camille, do you want to follow up on that? How much of, of people abandoning their pets in parks is going on right now? You know, unfortunately, we're seeing a reported increase in this, and I th think Phil is totally right. There's likely a lot more that we don't know about. We're really just scratching the surface with what we see. And, uh, you know, people, the reasons for this are obvious, but people um, are no longer at home as much as they used to be. People are facing financial crunches and making difficult decisions on that basis. And we fail to promote a responsible pet guardianship culture in this province and fail to encourage people to think about having pets as part of their families and offering a life to those animals instead of um, buying animals just to fulfill a need that they have. Hmm. I'm going to follow up on that responsible guardianship angle in a little bit, but let me get uh, Kathy in here right now and just give us your experience uh, in Western Canada. Are you seeing the same things that we are here? We certainly are seeing, um, as, as Phil mentioned, our shelters and rescues are full. Um, we don't have um, any uh, areas where we're seeing mass abandonments, but we know that this is happening uh, for the reasons that, that Phil mentioned, access to care and the shelters are full. Um, we also are, are seeing an increase in people's individual experiences and them facing crises and needing sometimes just a temporary place for their pet to be and they're not being that option as well. And, and you know, we... Um, 
and my colleagues in BC, uh, when someone reaches out to us for help, if we're not able to assist them, unfortunately what's happening is there's nowhere for us to refer them to. Um, and so, you know, we, we, we don't know what's happening to these animals when, when we get off the phone and someone is in crisis and they're going to lose their housing. That's a big issue in BC right now. Lack of pet friendly housing, lack of housing in general, lack of pet friendly housing has created an absolute crisis. Um, our program provides temporary foster care for up to six months. And even that amount of time is not enough for some people to find safe and affordable housing where they can keep their pets. Phil, do you do that at the Humane Society, this this foster care for six months type of thing? Uh, yeah, we have an urgent care foster program for individuals experiencing temporary crisis. Um, we, we tend to cap closer to about a year and 12 months, and but similar, but it still sometimes isn't enough. And that, that program's demand has been seeing a, a really skyrocketing rate of, of entrance requests over the last two years. What generally is happening, I mean, I think we can speculate here, but you, you've seen this firsthand. What's happening in people's lives that would warrant them going to you and saying, I can't do it anymore, you've got to take my pet for X number of months? There's, there's a wide variety. We've been seeing an increase in um, housing instability issues and individuals coming in for that, but there's also domestic violence um, that animals will come in for through the program. But I would say those, those two pieces are pretty key. The, the housing instability has been causing quite a rise over the last couple of months. Camille, let's go back at this. Responsible guardianship as it relates to pets. What are you getting at there? Yeah, you know, I think in this province, we largely treat people's companion animals as their own problem. And we don't provide enough social support through public funding and other you know, public provincial mechanisms to support people in keeping their animals with them. Um, I don't think you generally see people who want to give up animals and who feel good about that decision. I suspect a lot of abandonment has to do not only with inability to find a place for those animals to go, but also the social shame of feeling like a failure and being unable to keep that animal with you in your own home. Um, but you know what we see in this province, Steve, is uh, and across the country, is largely governments treating these sheltering type issues as a private problem that charities should address, instead of providing you know public infrastructure and really strong supports to make sure that you know shelters have the capacity, that rescues have the capacity to um, deal with this question and this issue when people can't care for animals any longer. So what does that look like? If you you know in in, in your best world, what does a more community based approach look like? Yeah, you know, I think we do some public funding of some shelter operations, especially when you look at um, larger cities like Toronto. Um, Toronto Animal Services receives funding for operating shelters. But most shelter and rescue operations are run on donations. They're run on volunteer power. They're run um, because people, out of the goodness of their hearts, believe it's the right thing to do for care, to care for animals. Uh, and that, of course, is the case. But there's also a lot of social and public benefits that accrue from making sure that we have this public infrastructure to take in cats, dogs, rabbits, reptiles, other animals who need homes. Kathy? Oh, sure. Yeah, absolutely. And I and I agree with um, Camilla 100%. We advocate, you know, that pets should be included in the social safety net. And so when we're looking at supporting families, we should be looking at supporting all members of the families, including and including the companion animals. And that would ex extend to providing funding to organizations that are supporting the animals because of the work that Pause for Hope does we you know we're often working with the same families that our colleagues in social services are supporting we're just supporting their their companion animals and they're supporting the humans but really we need a system that is looking at animal welfare not only as a social service, but as a social justice issue. Um, because what we are seeing is families that are struggling are disproportionately marginalized mm -hmm. and don't have access to human services in the same way that they are struggling with access to animal services. In which case, Phil, what do you need? <laughs> there, there's a lot that's needed on that, I think. And, and we're lucky at this point that the Vet Act in Ontario is up for review. Um, and revision because the the entire model of how veterinary care and access to care is delivered in the province needs an overhaul. It's it's an antiquated and dated system, and it's preventing um, right now solutions that could make care more accessible to individuals and pets and families from from existing. Um, the last major review happened in the late 80s, 
and it, it's time to not only be caught up, but also to be forward looking and you know, evaluate the models that can make care accessible. We focus a lot on um, sheltering and reactionary programs, which are necessary because the preventative programming and the preventative services aren't there to support people before they hit their breaking point and before those animals um, end up without anywhere else to go. I'm sure most people watching this don't understand the nuances of what you're trying to advance here right now, but is it a question of what? More storage, more care, more what? I think it's more capacity within the industry. Um, care providers within the veterinary industry across the country, are there's, there's a national shortage. Right? There's not enough veterinarians, there's not enough veterinary technicians and other uh, paraprofessionals to deliver the services to the volume of animals that exist in the country that need support. And the models of care delivery aren't sufficient enough to be accessible. So at Toronto Humane, we're taking a different approach to access to care and looking at alternative models of veterinary care services that can provide vaccinations and preventative wellness services and spays and neuters at rates that are more accessible and affordable for people that are experiencing challenges in an effort to prevent people from hitting the breaking point where animals are needing to be surrendered to the shelter. There's a, there's a huge capacity issue just within the infrastructure to deliver care um, going on. Camille, would an uptick in adoptions solve this? I think that would certainly help, but we, we can't just look at adoptions and on you know the demand side of things for animals. We also look, have to look at the supply side of things for animals. So we know, Steve, that during the pandemic, um, everyone wanted a puppy, everyone wanted a cat, shelters were empty, and enterprising people, backyard breeders, puppy mills, stepped in to fill that void by mm. breeding animals at astronomical rates, selling them for you know astronomical prices uh, to profit from people's desire for companionship during the pandemic. So you know, in a sense, we sort of glutted the marketplace with with animals um, you know who were were being purchased and sold instead of being adopted. And some of those animals are now the ones who are being given up to shelters. Um, that's why adoption is so important and public infrastructure to encourage adoption is so important. But I think another piece of that puzzle is that we don't actually regulate dog breeding or cat breeding or any other animal breeding in most of this country. I was going to ask you about that. Should, we, should there have been a crackdown during that puppy mill breeding situation? Yeah, well, I think one of the concerns is what conditions were these animals being kept in so that so many baby cats and baby dogs could be pumped out at such a high volume to meet that demand. Um, you know, we know that puppy mills run untrammeled in so many places in this country, the same thing for kitten mills. And, you know, in Ontario, for instance, and virtually everywhere else, uh, the government doesn't even know who's breeding dogs because there's no requirement to get a license, there's no requirement to get an inspection, to be approved to start breeding dogs. And uh, governments have no way of following up and checking to see what those conditions are like. And when puppy mills are busted because authorities maybe get a tip from the public, uh, we often find just appalling conditions. Um, you know, mother dogs kept for years in tiny cages and filthy, appalling situations with horrific injuries. Uh, we know oftentimes these dogs who are, who are sold to the public come with health problems because of poor breeding practices and poor veterinary care. So I think it's something the governments really need to get a grasp on. I well remember, at least I think I well remember, there's a guy who's on Toronto City Council right now named Mike Cole, but I think when he was a member of the Ontario Legislature, he held a press conference at Queen's Park to, to crack down on puppy mills that were abusing animals, and he, he broke down in the middle of his press conference, mm. uh, overcome at the sadness of what he was seeing because he was so appalled at what he was seeing. This is a thing, isn't it? It's a horrible thing. I've been present for those puppy mill busts, and you just see these dogs whose fur is matted, who reek of urine and feces, who've been confined in basements, in warehouses and sheds, and forced to breed for years and years. Um, there's really no excuse for it, and I think a lot of provincial politicians have taken note of this issue before, but no government has ever stood up and said, we're going to regulate puppy breeding, we're going to regulate um, animal breeding and get control over this problem. Kathy, is this an issue where you are? Yeah, absolutely. And recently, um, we have seen some more large scale removals from our uh, BCSPCA um, from breeders who uh, ramped up their operations during the pandemic to try to meet this need. And now that they're, the demand is gone, they are um, overcrowded with puppies and so have turned to the SPCA to take these to take these animals in. So, I mean, that that is, you know, typically are just a, a pandemic puppy, the definition of a pandemic puppy right there. Um, and we had a government that um, had drafted le legislation for um, breeding uh, registrations um, and it just, it didn't move anywhere. And so, you know, we, we were optimistic about 
six years ago. Um, but again, there's, you know, there is no regulation. There's no regulations for rescues as well. And I think that is also very problematic. We saw at the beginning of the pandemic organizations that were mass importing uh, van loads of puppies from the United States in almost equally horrific conditions as we see in in some puppy mills they were crowned in crates they were adopted off in the midnight uh, at uh, in parking lots um, and then you know many of these animals were sick some of them had to be euthanized because they should never have left the shelter they were so ill um, and and then what we're seeing now is some many of these animals that have come through have behavior and or health issues that their families are not prepared or able to deal with Hmm. Let me just add this. Um, Kathy, you do a blog, and one of the issues that you have raised in the blog is, and I must confess it's been going through my head while we've been having this conversation, and that is the tendency for us to be rather judgy of the people yeah. who give up their animals in the middle of this uh, circumstance they find themselves in. Here's Kathy writing in her blog, if we reject the assumptions that people are, quote, giving up on their pets, and that unhoused or low-income people can't take care of their animals, then we can see the truth, that the real issues we should be focusing on are the lack of pet-friendly housing, poverty, domestic violence, illegal breeders and traffickers, access to veterinary care. That's Kathy on the record on that. Camille, why don't you pick up on that? It's easy to be judgy here. It's tougher to be compassionate. Why do we need more of the latter and less of the former? You know, it's, it's always struck me as funny, and I could not agree more with Kathy's points. Um, but you know, so, so so some people have great compassion for animals, but not for the humans who share their lives with those animals. And uh, I think that's part of just being a well-rounded, compassionate, you know, generous human being is appreciating that people get into difficult circumstances, and it's not their fault that inequality is massive in the society, and that they have to make those tough choices. Um, Kathy made a really good point in her blog, which is the lack of pet-friendly accommodations and housing in this country. In Ontario, we are lucky in a sense because there actually are laws that say that you can include a no pets clause in a lease. Now that doesn't prevent a landlord from discriminating against somebody who's got a dog at the outset and refusing to rent to them, mm -hmm. but they can't kick them out ostensibly once they're in a rental unit. Um, that doesn't exist anywhere in the rest of the country. Mm -hmm. And so you've got all these folks who share their lives with companion animals and are desperately seeking accommodation. And we know how difficult finding housing is for so many people, especially if they're low income. And then they face this added challenge of having animals that they want to continue living with who are parts of their family and being forced into this impossible situation of giving up those animals or living in their cars. So would you, do you think we need a law that prohibits landlords from tossing tenants uh, if they have pets? Uh, absolutely, this is something that would be incredibly helpful in addressing the pet um, challenges that people face when they're looking for accommodation. Um, you know, there's ways to deal before anybody starts raising the alarm about what about landlords and their rights? There's ways to deal with tenants who cause problems, including with animals who cause problems. Um, but that doesn't mean that people should be denied the chance of a place to live from the outset just because they live with a cat or a dog or a guinea pig or a rabbit. Or a snake or a lizard? Or a snake or a lizard. I mean, <laughs> prefer that they don't adopt those pets in the first place, but if they have them, they should stay with their families. I gotcha. Uh, judginess over compassion. Where are you on that, Phil? It's rampant in animal welfare. I mean, and we need compassion, and, and I, I agree with all the points made. The biggest issue with that is so long as we're focusing on judgment, we're not actually going to be looking at real world solutions that can address the underlying problem and the root cause. And I think the sector has shown that. I mean, decades took, we, we spent decades working on the judgment and the reaction piece, and it hasn't resolved the problem. If we start meeting people where they're at and coming up with solutions that are actually going to address the underlying issue, we can prevent the problem from existing at the same degree that it does right now. And we're not going to do that so long as we're judging people, and we're sure not going to know how broad the problem is if they're not even willing to come to us because they're afraid of judgment. Hmm. Kathy, I, I take no joy in saying this, but uh, certainly if you travel through downtown Toronto, and I imagine it's the same in Vancouver, you will see homeless people outdoors on very cold days, and as they have their blankets over them, they have their blankets over their dogs as well. There are many people uh, who don't have a place to live, uh, but who have big enough hearts to actually take care of their companions uh, while they're in very precarious circumstances. You see that too, I, I assume? Uh, yeah, absolutely. And um, before COVID, uh, we operated free animal health clinics. And so we would bring a team 
of veterinarians and vet te technicians uh, to homeless shelters and other service agencies, and we would do a, a free clinic. And, you know, we did them for eight years. And over the time, um, you know, our veterinarians uh, would say that the animals that they saw at these clinics were as healthy as the animals that they see in their private practice. And in fact, dogs that they see in these at these free clinics are generally more socialized than the dogs that they see in private practice because the dogs are doing what dogs are meant to do and that's roaming with their pack, right? And they're out and they're 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 not sitting on a couch for eight hours a day. Uh, they had healthier body weights because they were getting the exercise that they need. And you know, one of the things that they saw more of was fleas and parasites, but those things are relatively easy uh, to treat. And so the, you know, that the notion that um, homeless uh, pets are suffering is is not well supported. And, and also, again, people are concerned about the animal, but they're not concerned about the person. Like they're, they're more worried about the fact that there's a, a, a dog sleeping homeless on the street than they are their person, which to me is very problematic because behind every animal in need, there is a person in need as well. For the people watching or listening to this right now, tell them one thing they can do to help. You know, support your local shelter, your humane society, support rescues. Also, if you yourself are thinking about bringing an animal into your family, um, please, please, please adopt and don't buy that animal from a breeder or from a puppy mill, and especially not from Kijiji, because that's almost certainly going to be from a puppy mill. Um, I encourage people to think about what they can offer to an animal and what type of animal in what type of situation is compatible with their lifestyle. Um, you know, are you a busy family that's always on the go and might do better with a cat rather than a dog? Uh, that's the type of thing that rescues and shelters can advise you on. They can look at your situation and say, look, we have this adoptable animal who's going to fit in really well with your family. And that's the type of thing that makes sure that that adoption is going to be sustainable in the long term instead of just a fleeting, you know, thing where somebody buys a, a puppy for a Christmas or a birthday present or a chick for Easter, which is never good. Gotcha. Uh, I want to thank Kathy Pallison for being out there in British Columbia for us on our program tonight, Phil Nichols from the Toronto Humane Society, and Camille Labchuk, Executive Director of Animal Justice. Uh, great to have all three of you on TVO tonight. Many thanks. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Monday on the agenda. The Raptors are this growing franchise. They've been here for, you know, almost three decades now in the city. I wanted people to know that since the very beginning, it's had a very diverse history and background, even through the people that worked with the team. That's Monday on the Agenda.